Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, especially, General. Welcome to Chatham House. And I'd like to welcome everybody else here who's come this morning uh, to uh, listen to General Buhari. Um, Chatham House is more independent than anything you could imagine. It is entirely neutral, it has no political stance, and that is why it is a favoured venue for people of all hues from across the spectrum, political spectrum, to give their views <coughs> because they get an open and fair hearing here. And that is, uh, I'm sure, why your people, General, have and you yourself have come here uh, today. Uh, a couple of points of housekeeping before we start. Uh, it's what I call the on-off. Uh, to remind people that today's meeting is on the record, so what you say, General, and what anybody else says in the question and answer session can be attributed uh, and can be used publicly with attribution. The off is the usual one, please turn phones off so we're not interrupted during the meeting. And I know you think you've turned them off, but I'm going to check mine because I may not have done. <laughs> and, you, and you might do the same. Um, General Buhari, you need very little introduction. Um, people know well that you were Head of State and Commander-in-Chief 30 years ago. Um, two things I would highlight is that you know all about petroleum revenues because of the jobs you have done since then, and more than one of them, and because you know about elections. You've contested a few of those, too. And also, uh, more recently, my understanding is that you played a major role in unifying the opposition in Nigeria a couple of years ago. When I visited you, sir, in Kaduna State, uh, uh, every, every six months, six or 12 months, when I was High Commissioner there 10 years ago, two things struck me most forcibly, and I won't spare your blushes. One was the modesty of your lifestyle, visiting you at home there in Kaduna State which was very striking for a Nigerian politician. <laughs> and secondly, sir, was that your clarity of thought and speech. We look forward to hearing more of such clarity from you today as you talk to us about the prospects of de democratic consolidation in Africa and the Nigerian transition. General Buhari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Please take the floor. Um, I would like to uh, stand by the existing protocol. Um, I thought uh, it's like back home, you, you need two pages of protocol. <laughs> but uh, mercifully here, uh, they have been very uh, kind to make it uh, short and sharp, like a uh, drill sergeant major's move. Um, for me to start by thanking the Chatham House for the invitation to talk about this important topic at this critical time. When speaking about Nigeria overseas, I normally prefer to be my country's public relations and marketing officer, extolling her virtues and hoping to attract investments and tourists. But as we all know, Nigeria is now battling with many challenges. And if I refer to them, I do so only to impress on our friends in the United Kingdom that we are quite aware of our shortcomings and are doing our best to address them. The 2015 general election in Nigeria is generating a lot of interests within and outside the country. This is understandable. Nigeria Africa's most populous country and largest economy is at a defining moment, a moment that has great implications beyond the democratic project and beyond the borders of my dear country. So let me say upfront that the global interest in Nigeria's landmark election is not misplaced at all and indeed should be commended. For this is an election that has serious import for the world. 
I urge the international community to continue to focus on Nigeria at this very critical moment. Given increasing global linkages, it is in our collective interest that the postponed elections should hold on the rescheduled dates, that they should be free and fair, that their outcomes should be respected by all parties, and that any form of extension under whatever guise is unconstitutional and will not be tolerated. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the dissolution of the USSR in 1991, the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War, democracy became the dominant and most preferred system of government across the globe. That global transition has been aptly captured as the triumph of democracy and the most preeminent political idea of our time. On a personal note, the phased end of the USSR was a turning point for me. It convinced me that change can be brought about without firing a single shot. As you all know, I had been a military head of state in Nigeria for 20 months. We intervened because we were unhappy with the state of affairs in our country. We wanted to arrest the drift, driven by patriotism, influenced by the prevalence and popularity of such drastic measures all over Africa and elsewhere. We fought our way to power. But the global triumph of democracy has shown that another and a preferable path to change is possible. It is an important lesson I have carried with me since, and a lesson that is not lost on the African continent. In the last two decades, democracy has grown strong roots in Africa. Elections once so rare are now so commonplace. As at the time I was a military head of state, between 1983 and 1985, only four African countries had regular multi-party elections. But the number of electoral democracies in Africa, according to Freedom House, jumped to 10 in 1992 to 1993, then to 18 in 1994, 1995, and to 24 in 2005, 2006. According to the New York Times, 42 of the 48 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa conducted multi-party elections between 1990 and 2002. The newspaper also reported that between 2000 and 2002, ruling parties in four African countries, Senegal, Mauritius, Ghana, and Mali, peacefully handed over power to victorious opposition parties. In addition, the proportion of African countries categorized as not free by Freedom House declined from 59% in 1983 to 35% in 2003. Without doubt, Africa has been part of the current global wave of democratization. But the growth of democracy on the continent has been uneven. According to Freedom House, the number of electoral democracies in Africa slipped from 24 in 2007, 2008 to 19. In 2011, 2002, while the percentage of countries categorized as not free, assuming for the sake of argument, that we accept their definition of free increased from 35% in 2003 to 41% in 2013. Also, there have been some reversals at different times in Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Lesotho, Mali, Madagascar, Mauritania, 
and Togo. We can choose to look at the glass of democracy in Africa as either half full or half empty. While you can't have representative democracy without elections, it is equally important to look in the quality of the elections and to remember that mere elections do not democracy make. It is globally agreed that democracy is not an event but a journey. And that the destination of that journey is democratic consolidation, the state where democracy has become so rooted and so routine and widely accepted by all actors. With this important destination in mind, it is clear that though many African countries now hold regular elections, very few of them have consolidated the practice of democracy. It is important also to state at this point that just as with elections, a consolidated democracy cannot be an end by itself. I will argue that it is not enough to hold a series of elections or even to peacefully alternate power among parties. It is much more important that the promise of democracy goes beyond just allowing people to freely choose their leaders. It is much more important that democracy should deliver on the promise of choice, of freedoms, of security, of lives and property, of transparency and accountability, of rule of law, of good governance, and of shared prosperity. It is very important that the problem is embedded in the concept of democracy, the promise of a better life for the generality of the people is not delivered in the breach. Now, let me quickly turn to Nigeria. As you all know, Nigeria's fourth republic is in its 16th year. And this general election will be the fifth in a row. This is a major sign of progress for us, given that our first republic lasted five years and three months. The second republic ended after four years and two months. And the third republic was a stillbirth. <laughs> However, Longevity is not the only reason why everyone is so interested in this election. The major difference this time around is that for the very first time since transition to civil rule in 1999, the ruling People's Democratic Party, the PDP, is facing its stiffest opposition so far from our party, the All Progressive Congress, the APC. We once had about 50 political parties, but there was no real competition. Now Nigeria is transitioning from a dominant party system to a competitive electoral policy, which is a major marker on the road to democratic consolidation. As you know, peaceful alteration of power through competitive elections have happened in Ghana, Senegal, Malawi, and Mauritius in recent times. The prospect of democratic consolidation in Africa will be further brightened when that eventually happens in our country, Nigeria. But there are other reasons why Nigerians and the whole world are intensely focused on this year's elections, chief of which is that the elections are holding in the shadow of huge security, economic, and social uncertainties in Africa's most populous country and largest economy. On insecurity, there is a genuine cause for worry, both within and outside Nigeria. Apart from the civil war era, at no other time in our history has Nigeria been this insecure. 
Boko Haram has suddenly put Nigeria on the terrorism map, killing more than 13,000 of our nationals, displacing millions internally and externally, and at a time holding on to portions of our territory the size of Belgium. What has been consistently lacking is the required leadership in our battle against insurgency. I, as a retired general and a former head of state, have always known about our soldiers. They are capable, they are well-trained, patriotic, brave, and always ready to do their duty in the service of our country. We can bear witness to the gallant role of our military in Burma, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Darfur, and in many other peacekeeping operations in several parts of the world. But in the matter of this insurgency, our soldiers have neither received the necessary support nor the required incentives to tackle this problem. The government has also failed in any effort towards a multidimensional response, response to this problem leading to a situation in which we have now become dependent on our neighbors to come to our rescue. Let me assure you that if I am elected president, the world will have no cause to worry about Nigeria as it has so recently. that Nigeria will return to its stabilizing role in West Africa, and that no inch of Nigerian territory will ever be lost to the enemy because we will pay special attention to the welfare of our soldiers in and out of service. We will give them adequate and modern arms and ammunition to work with. We will improve intelligence gathering and border patrols to choke Boko Haram's financial and equipment channels. We will be tough on terrorism and tough on its root causes by initiating a comprehensive economic development plan, promoting infrastructural development, job creation, agriculture and industry in the affected areas. We will always act on time and not allow problems to irresponsibly fester. And I, Muhammad Buhari, will always lead from the front. And return, and return Nigeria to its leadership role in regional and international efforts to combat terrorism. On the economy, the fall in prices of oil has brought our economic and social stress into full relief. After the rebasing exercise in April 2014, Nigeria overtook South Africa as Africa's largest economy. Our GDP is now valued at United States dollar 510 billion, and our economy rated 26 in the world. Also, on the bright side, inflation has been kept at single digit for a while, and our economy has grown at an average of 7% for about a decade. But it is more of paper growth, a growth that on account of mismanagement, profligacy, and corruption has not translated to human development or shared prosperity. A development, a development economist once said, three questions should be asked about a country's development. One, what is happening to poverty? Two, what is happening to unemployment? And three, what is happening to inequality? The answers to these three questions in Nigeria show that the current administration has created two economies in one country. A sorry tale of two nations. One economy for a few who have so much in their tiny islands of prosperity, and the other economy for the many who have so little in their vast ocean of misery. 
even by official figures, 33 to 1% of Nigerians live in extreme poverty. There's at least 60 million, almost the population of the United Kingdom. There is also the unemployment crisis, simmering beneath the surface, ready to explode as the slightest stress with officially 23.9% of our adult population and almost 60% of our youth unemployed. We also have one of the highest rates of inequalities in the world. With all this, it is not surprising that our, our performance on most governance and developmental indicators like M.O. Ibrahim Index on African governance and the UNDP's Human Development Index are unflattering. We fall in the prices of oil, which accounts for more than 70% of government revenues, a lack of savings for more than a decade of oil boom, the poor will be disproportionately impacted. In the face of dwindling revenues, a good place to start the reposition of Nigeria's economy is to swiftly tackle two ills that have bloomed under the present administration, waste and corruption. And in doing this, I will, if elected, lead the way with the force of personal example. <laughs> On corruption, there will be no confusion as to where I stand. <laughs> corruption will have no place and the corrupt will not be appointed into my administration. <laughs> First and foremost, we will plug the holes in the budgetary processes. Revenue producing entities such as NNPC, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, and custom and exercise will have one set of books only. <laughs> Their revenues will be publicly disclosed and regularly audited. The institutions of state dedicated to fighting corruption <coughs> will be given independence and prosecutorial authority without political interference. But I must emphasize that any war wage on corruption should not be misconstrued as settling all the scores or a witch hunt. I am running for president to lead Nigeria to prosperity, not adversity. In reforming the economy, we will use savings that arise from blocking these leakages and the proceeds recovered from corruption to fund our party's social investment programs in education, health, and safety nets such as free school meals for children, emergency public works for unemployed youth, and pensions for the elderly. As a progressive party, we must reform our political economy to unleash the pent up ingenuity and productivity of the Nigerian people, thus freeing them from the cause of poverty. We will run a private sector led economy, but to maintain an active role for government through strong regulatory oversight and deliberate interventions and incentives to diversify the base of our economy, strengthen productive sectors improve the productive capacities of our people and create jobs for our team and youth. In short, we will run a functional economy driven by a world view that sees growth not as an end by itself, but as a tool to create a society that works for all, rich and poor alike. On March 28th, Nigeria has a decision to make to vote for the continuity of failure or to elect for progressive change. I believe the people will choose wisely. 
in sum, I think that given its strategic importance, Nigeria can trigger a wave of democratic consolidation in Africa. But as a starting point, we need to get this critical election right by ensuring that they go ahead and depriving those who want to scuttle it the benefit of draining our pledging democracy. That way, we will all see democracy and democratic consolidation as tools of solving pressing problems in a sustainable way, not as end in themselves. Permit me to close this discussion on a personal note. I have heard and read references to me as a former dictator in many respected British newspapers, including the world regarded economist. Let me say without sounding defensive that dictatorship goes with military rule. Though some might be less dictatorial than others. I take responsibility for whatever happened under my watch. <clears throat> I cannot change the past, but I can change the present and the future. So before you, so before you is a former military ruler and a converted democrat who is ready to operate under democratic norms and is subjecting himself to the rigors of democratic election for the fourth time. You may ask, why is he doing this? This is a question I ask myself all the time, too. And here is my humble answer. Because the work of making Nigeria great is not yet done. Because I still believe that change is possible, this time through the ballot. And most importantly, because I still have the capacity and the fashion to dream and work for a Nigeria that will be respected again in the Committee of Nations and that all Nigerians will be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. General, presidential candidate, thank you very much indeed <laughs> for those words and for sticking closely to the time, as I thought you would. For those, we're going into questions now. For those who've been watching on what I think is called live stream, you can send in questions using the hashtag, C, uh, hashtag CHAfrica, and they, I believe, will be passed to me, and I will pass them to the general uh, in principle. Uh, otherwise, uh, when people want to ask questions, um, please state your uh, name and affiliation if you have one. Um, confine yourself, if you would, please, to one question, because I don't think we'll get through enough people otherwise. Uh, and I'm afraid I reserve the right to uh, uh, cut off, well, to curb anyone who wants to make a rival speech, because that's not this morning's agenda. <laughs> Uh, General, do you want to sit there or do you want to take back to the stand for the question? As you, as you like, wherever, whichever you feel more comfortable. Yeah, um, I think I will stand there. When we'll stand the, when there. The right. Yeah. Let us have the first question over on, um, at, right at the back there, lady with the black turban. Thank you, Adiza. I'll put calls observed. My name is Olutoni Pamela Kinjobi. I'm a journalist and I live in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, my question, sir, is um, how um, do you propose to grow the Nigerian economy considering, considering the fact that the global economy is still in recession? And then you said something about choking Boko Haram. Would you propose to granting general yeah, sorry, amnesty? Sorry, I'm going to limit you to one question. You had yours. I'm, I've got to be strict here, otherwise okay. we won't get around. Thank, Thank you. you very much and indeed. And the question is Boko Haram <laughs> the, the second question, which you may, not, may or may not answer, is... Would you propose to grant an amnesty to, uh, general amnesty to Boko Haram? Thank you. Uh, amnesty. Right. Okay. Um, in, the, in the front row here, if the microphone could come forward, take one more, and then I'll ask you, General, to address those. 
My name is Garba Sani, uh, uh, Foundation for Good Governance and Development in Nigeria, and uh, uh, Chairman, uh, APC Major Working Committee UK. My question is, uh, in view of the current state in Nigeria, in terms of uh, the huge, huge need for change, and therefore the cry for uh, the general to actually, uh, by the grace of God, take power and bring about the change, the high expectation is uh, such that people will really be looking for some uh, quick solutions uh, in view of this deep, deep uh, need for change. What would the uh, general do uh, in, say, the first 100 days when elected into power to uh, sustain this expectation that the Nigerians have for him to bring about positive change? Thank you. Would you like to take those questions first, General, before we have any more, or would you want some more from the floor first? Well, let me have some more. Okay. Here we are in the middle of the block. The lady in the middle of the block there. That's it. <coughs> General, um, I'm a public health specialist in Africa, um, and I'm from Zimbabwe, so I'm already invading the house here. Um, Dorcas Guata, Nigeria was outstanding in leading in the Ebola crisis, and you showed us what you're capable of. I'm just wondering in your leadership how you're, um, how you're planning to carry that forward in terms of strengthening health, health systems in Nigeria, and particularly focusing on women and children who are the most vulnerable in the population. Thank you very much. Let's have one more over on the far left here, the third, third row back, second row back, that one, there we are. Good morning, General. Thank you very much for your presentation there. My name is Priscilla Winkbub and TV. So you made mention in your presentation that you would arm Boko Haram when you get into office. It is widely reported in Nigeria. Disarms. I'm so sorry. You would disarm Boko Haram. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> please, please carry on. <laughs> So, as I was saying, you made mention of the fact that you would disarm Boko Haram and that you would arm the Nigerian army um, to be able to deal with, combat Boko Haram. But it is also widely reported um, in the Nigerian dailies that you once said that an attack against Boko Haram was an attack against the North. And I wondered, sir, if you therefore arm the army to then attack Boko Haram and destroy their properties, would that not still be an attack against the North? Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take a pause there, General, yeah. if you answer yeah. some of those questions. Yeah. Well, well, Boko Haram is taking the day. Uh, the, the first question, Amna Sifu Boko Haram. Um, I, I think um, uh, I wouldn't go to that office with that promise. Um, I have mentioned uh, in my address how at least 13,000 Nigerians have been killed by Boko Haram, how millions of them have been displaced. Uh, they are put in different camps, we call uh, internally displaced persons camps. Uh, schools have been burnt. There are so much disruption to normal life. People who are not able to farm, and while they farm, they couldn't harvest. And for me, just for wanting Boko Haram both to say that I will uh, give uh, amnesty, I think I'm going to be unfair to the system. We want to secure Nigeria. We must have the time to help uh, collect enough intelligence to make sure that those that we got uh, are given the chance in civil courts to be properly prosecuted. Uh, the second one, high expectation, what to do with the first 100 days. Um, yes, uh, I, I respect that question because quietly I was thinking about this high expectation. Uh, those who are following the trail of uh, campaigns and see how people were turning out, some becoming emotional and crying, I am really getting scared. If I get there, they will expect uh, miracles within the next week or, or months. 
uh, that would be very dicey handling that one. And I think uh, we have to have a deliberate campaign to tamper high expectation with some reasonableness uh, on the part of those who are expecting miracles to happen. But uh, this cost of first 100, uh, some of it is fraudulent. And I uh, don't want to, to participate in any fraud in any form. Um, uh, Nigerians know that we are in trouble as a people and as a country. And uh, when we get there, we will quickly uh, get uh, a correct intelligence of what is on the ground and inform Nigerians. And just in line with what I have just read, we will make sure that uh, misappropriation, misapplication of public resources will not be allowed. And we will be surprised how much savings we will realize. And that saving will be ploughed back into development. And this is what I can promise. But I will remove that 100 days uh, uh, mystery some proper, some politicians uh, created. Uh, health, Ebola, well, luckily the governor of Rivers State is here. <laughs> <laughs> um, she brought me a meeting. It is him and the governor of Lagos State that uh, experienced Ebola. And uh, they did extremely well by moving uh, fast enough. They didn't wait for the central government to make sure that uh, they have uh, uh, done something about it and uh, Nigeria was certified Ebola free. So we are lucky that um, we had very competent uh, and by fabulous coincidence uh, APC governors in place <laughs> to, to kill Ebola. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think um, health is one of the uh, areas that have been allowed in those 16 years we refer to, to really deteriorate. Um, uh, the life, especially in the rural areas, is pathetic. And because of lack of basic facilities in the rural areas that aggravate the movement of able-bodied bodies uh, to population centers, and that increase the rate of crime because of lack of jobs, lack of facilities, lack of even basic uh, things to survive. So I think an APC government uh, has done a lot of studies and our manifesto has uh, consciously looked at this and uh, we will try as much as possible to make sure that um, uh, infrastructure led by power, the social services led by education and health uh, as rapidly as possible uh, given uh, to the people. And that's, that's what, that is a promise, and we have got it into our manifesto, uh, and we will keep, uh, uh, we'll keep uh, our promise intact. Uh, attack on Boko Haram against the North. Um, I, I think this is very, very uninformed <laughs> opinion. Uh, out of those 13,000 casualties, I believe 12,000 are Northerners. So how can Northerners feel that uh, attack on Boko Haram is attack on them? The schools that were vandalized, the children that were killed, even the Chobo girls, over 220 of them that had been missing for 10 months, are all Northerners. All most of them are Northerners. So I, I think one has to examine one's, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, reason for believing or disbelieving uh, allegations against uh, 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 part of the, of the country, any part of the country. It's just really like saying the stealing of, of the crude uh, of about 400,000 barrels a day, uh, the people from Maiduguru or Sokoto are responsible for it. Most of them, they have never seen the sea. <laughs> so it's just this, this type of thing. Um, no, I assure you that um, uh, People generally in the north are fighting the Boko Haram in their own way by passing uh, intelligence to the law enforcement agents about their movements and so on. They are doing their best to fight Boko Haram because they are the biggest casualties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take a second.
second batch of questions. If we could start over here on the far left with the gentleman in the third row. Hi, my name is Cliff Stafford from BNP Paribas. What will be your number three priorities in terms of top three priorities in terms of attracting foreign investment, be it in oil, gas, power, etc.? Thank you. Uh, right at the uh, back. Sorry, I'm not clear about it. foreign investment. Your, your, your my three priorities. What, what will be your top three priorities in terms yes. of attracting foreign investment to Nigeria, be it in oil and gas or power or any other sector? Uh, gentleman at the back waving two hands. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Aminu Isiaku. I'm a uh, doctorate um, degree student uh, at the University of Portsmouth. Um, General Sir, you are very known um, to fight corruption and that the problem with, um, uh, with that by some Nigerians is that when you took office, I mean when you take office, you are going to start investigating each and every political office holder from 1960 till date. <laughs> so how will you um, clear the minds of uh, such Nigerians, you know, uh, the way you are going to fight Boko Haram when we take office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go into the, the middle here. This gentleman right in the middle who's standing up now. Your, your question, if you would. <clears throat> uh, thank you, General Buhari. Uh, I'm Abdul Rafu Mustafa from the University of Oxford. I think one thing we can say about Nigeria today that it's never been as divided against itself as it is today sometimes deliberate policy by those who should know better. Were you to win the election in March, what practical steps will you take to address this problem? Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman in the, uh, with the white shirt there, with the hand up high, that's it. My name is Samson Esebwede from Deutsche Bank Emerging Markets Team. Um, I have a question around the credibility of the election on the 28th of March. Um, given the postponements, there's been some question mark, credibility question mark associated with this election, which would make it difficult to accept the outcome if indeed the elections doesn't go in your favor. My question then becomes, what processes does the opposition party have in place to ensure that the election is free and fair and, and, and that credibility issues wouldn't resort to some sort of civil uprising in the country. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop there with this batch because I want General to add two that have come in, two questions that have come in on Twitter, out of many that have come in. First question is from a Mr. Hassan Sani, who says, young people have been engaged in this election in greater numbers than ever before. How will you keep them engaged? And secondly, a slightly lighter note, perhaps, um, Mr. Olabisi says, what will General Bahari, what will you do, sir, about the high salaries paid to members of the National Assembly? <laughs> Looking at nobody in particular in the front row. <laughs> General, do you want to take those? Yes, I think I will have a time to take this. Um, the first one I have here is um, attracting foreign investment. I, I think uh, foreign investment, um, I, I think I mentioned it briefly in my address here, what they need is what we need, security. They, they will, nobody will take his uh, resources uh, in an environment that is insecure. So that is why security uh, is one of our first uh, uh, priorities to make sure we secure the country and then we efficiently manage it. Uh, that efficient management is getting jobs and stopping corruption and so on. So really uh, uh, attracting foreign investment is to persuade uh, the investors world over that uh, Nigeria once more is forced to cooperate with them by securing the country and uh, participating as much as possible to make uh, them recoup their investment because uh, it's, it's not a question of uh, 
uh, having a free ride. Uh, they, they don't invest just uh, uh, for humanitarian reasons, let me put it that way. <laughs> they want to invest so that they can recover uh, their capitals and make some profit. Uh, that's what sustains the world economy. So we have to think very quickly and put in place uh, assurances and uh, improve the system so that the environment is made uh, suitable for investment. Uh, corruption investigations. I have tried to uh, win or earn the confidence of, uh, of those who are scared of me because <laughs> of uh, previous antecedents. Uh, I have managed to visit 35 of the 36 states and I have held uh, 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 meetings with industrialists and so on in Lagos, in Kano, and have seen church ministers' uh, leadership in Abuja and different groups. Uh, and uh, whatever uh, I do as a meeting, I made sure, I said, when I get there, I will draw a line. Um, what is with the judiciary will encourage the judiciary to quickly deal with it. But uh, if we insist on looking backwards, as you are suggesting that from 1960 upwards, <laughs> then we'd have nothing to do and we may fail to achieve anything. Uh, while we have our manifesto, whatever we do, we have to try to see that the promises we have made and put in writing, we meet them. So, um, but we have said, from the day we are sworn in, uh, those who are responsible for public funds and properties uh, should work according to the law. Because there is no ministry you go in Nigeria or first title where there are no financial instructions and administrative instructions. It's a question of just ignoring the regulation on the ground. Uh, I think Nigerians, they have the capacity for making about 10, 160 degrees. And I, I, I am hoping that Nigerians will become accountable wherever they are. Uh, Nigeria divided uh, against itself. I haven't appreciated the full import of that question. Um, we have uh, a problem uh, uh, as a people. Uh, and uh, if you are following my statements, uh, I won't at least six months ago, that we have to be careful about Somalialization of Nigeria. We are a group of nationalities. Let's put it that way, the way some people want you to put it. We are so many different people, culturally, religiously, different backgrounds. We happen to come together, uh, courtesy of the British in 1914. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we, f we find it very difficult to separate now because there is so much intermarriage and that we have become so interdependent. Um, and our constitution uh, has been very deliberate in, uh, um, I think, uh, respecting our sensitivities as a people. And the freedom given in that constitution uh, is a guarantee that um, we will certainly uh, manage our differences among ourselves. So I'm afraid, I hope the person who has that question is living here, not in Nigeria. <laughs> we are making a lot of effort to make sure that uh, um, we continue to understand ourselves and accommodate ourselves um, in spite of whatever impression is created about the differences uh, among ourselves. So I, uh, especially when people are talking too much about religion, I said uh, the military is the most uh, cohesive of all the institutions in the country. And having been in the military, from second lieutenant to a general, holding all the positions, almost without the exception of command and staff, up to a general becoming head of state, and the Nigerian military has always been at least 80% Christian. If there is so much religious divide. I will never, I will never reach my, uh, the position I have reached. And up to today, there is nothing you can do. Uh, that's why I'm so confident about these differences. The most of, 
difficult one is the religious one. But if we can go over the religious one, then others, uh, I think, uh, would be easy uh, to deal with. So I, I think I'm more confident and, uh, and hopeful of uh, uh, being Nigerians than whoever asks this question. You still insist on making... <laughs> No, yeah. no, 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 yeah, that's later on. Yeah. So let, let, let me continue. Uh, credibility of election, 28th of March, what has opposition has? What, what we have firstly is our manifesto. Let Nigerians see what we are promising them. And I believe they will respect it. And then um, we are screaming to high heavens. And we are very impressed with our success so far, how the United States and Europe is openly backing us as far as having free and fair elections is concerned. Um, uh, we are very grateful to the Americans and to the Europeans, especially the British, that uh, they are uh, on the government on a daily basis, literally, uh, telling them that uh, they must not do anything against the Nigerian constitution. And that's what we need. That's the bottom line. So if, uh, if we don't, uh, if you are not worth anything back at home, uh, I think uh, they have tremendous respect for the British and the Americans for a lot of reasons which I wouldn't like to mention here. Uh, so I think they will listen to them and they will allow us to have free and fair elections. Um, how can you engage your people? Young people. Oh, young people, that's right, young people. Well, I think wherever I go, I mentioned it. More than 60%, uh, you know, of the Nigerian population are considered to be youth. And most of them are unemployed. And that's the trouble we are in. Um, and when I move throughout these 35 states, how some of these young men and women, from the Air Force to the venue of uh, our addresses, uh, to the House of uh, Community Leaders, how they will be jogging along the buses we are traveling in, sweating, but never getting tired, it makes me even more frightened. If you get those people uh, and you spent one, two years, and they haven't seen any difference, I think we will be in trouble. <laughs> so I'm very, very conscious of, uh, of that. <laughs> and there is a great incentive for me to work hard to make sure they get something to do, just to be in peace myself. <laughs> yes, a uh, high salary of National Assembly. <laughs> there are some National Assembly members here, <laughs> so I... <laughs> Um, uh, a lot of them are not going back because they have been won their party's uh, primaries. But even those that haven't gone back, I think they will remain relevant in their constituencies. So uh, I would like to touch their salaries now. <laughs> I don't know whether I will be constrained to touch it when I get there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> General, we're almost out of time. I'm going to take two more questions, I'm afraid, from the right-hand side. Lady in the second row here. If we could have a bit of quiet, please. <coughs> Lady in the second row here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Adenika Lucas, uh, I wanted to say that I, I'm, not I'm not afraid because... I'm here, I've just called out, that's why I'm tremoring. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you, sir, how do you feel that at this very moment everyone is screaming for change and they've chosen, the Nigerian people have chosen you and Professor Yemi Oshibajo. <laughs> they, are, they are screaming for change. I see it on the TV. I see it everywhere. See. People are literally changing, yearning for change, they're clamoring for change. How do you feel personally that these people are calling for you, sir. Thank you. And gentlemen standing up in the second row, and then, and then I want to add two questions from Twitter, and if we'll have to draw a line, I'm sorry. Thank you, General Buhari. My name is Don Oluyomi Aniam. I'm a leader in APC UK. 
my question is that um, in the context of the brilliant uh, speech that you have given us, sir, relating to the Nigerian democracy and Africa, do you consider that the success of this next uh, democratic process is going to be a template for the rest of the African continent? And that this APC government already has the templates in all the APC states that we have about how to govern and govern effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add two questions from Twitter. I thought those two questions were nicely gentle for you, General, so I'll, <laughs> I'll give you two to finish up with, which are a bit tougher. Uh, the first one is, um, someone has rung in, they haven't, I haven't got a name here, has come in on Twitter and said, do you have a position on Sharia law? And secondly, uh, Mr. Shafi Hamidu, who doesn't give his age, asks, uh, is it relevant to the election, your, your age? Uh, what would you plan to see, say to people about your own age? And on that note, we will finish. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a pity we are ending up with my age, but um, <laughs> all, all, all the same, uh, change how do I feel? Um, yes, um, certainly I, I have referred to the number of young men that have been following our convoys throughout the 35 states we have visited out of 36. Uh, and I have mentioned yeah, that uh, I am scared of the high expectation. Uh, that's what I'm afraid of, the, the high expectation. People want change, and um, the interesting thing about it is across the country. I started my campaign from Bayelsa, the president's uh, state, uh, and uh, throughout uh, south, south, southeast, southwest, north central, and the three geopolitical zones in the, in the north, um, the crowds, you know, you can't say this is bigger than this one, relative to the uh, to the population of respective states. Uh, and that, that's, that, that's what makes the high expectation frightening. <laughs> because you can't uh, tell these young people uh, that there are no money, uh, or you, you can't put some input into agriculture or mining, something that will absorb them, at least initially. Or you can't improve their schools, especially the tertiary institutions. Um, we are thinking of quickly putting an experienced, competent team uh, as a sort of a think tank to quickly advise us how we are going to meet this problem because it's real and it's coming and we cannot ferry it off. Um, well, uh, success to be sort of template for Africa APC's role. Well, uh, I think uh, I have covered that really in, in, in the address I have read. Um, change is certainly coming, and democratically, uh, and um, bringing the example of the Soviet Union, uh, where an empire uh, in the 20th century collapsed without a shot being fired. Everybody went home. Now there are 18 republics also. Uh, con can convince anybody that multi-party democratic system is the best form of governance. But the biggest caveat is elections must be free and fair. And that again comes to the issue why I am attempting for the first time. I'm not trying to impose myself, but um, 2003, we spent 30 months in court, ended up in the Nigerian Supreme Court. 2007, <coughs> Uh, we lasted uh, about 20 months in the courts, again ended up in the Supreme Court. 2011, uh, we were again in court for about eight, nine months and ended up in the Supreme Court. Uh, my personal insistence to keep on going until I get to the highest uh, legal, uh, constitutional legal body is to document uh, our belief that uh, we believe in multi-party democratic system. Uh, if we fail to learn by other people's mistakes that have developed the, their system uh, for generations, 
uh, our expectation of uh, getting there overnight uh, is not realistic. And, but let us document it, that at those times of our attempt to stabilize this system, there are some of us in Nigeria that are serious about it. And we are prepared to make the physical and the material uh, sacrifices, you know, to be lasting to the cause for solo. But uh, I think for the first time, I think I would encourage others to go if anything went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, age and relevance. Well, um, I'm very happy that uh, I have been able to, this is the 35 states out of 36. I haven't broken down. <laughs> Somebody announced me dead yesterday. <laughs> I, I had a call from Meduguri that uh, uh, somebody rushed into a friend's house crying. Say, what happened? He said, just said Buhari has died in hospital <laughs> in London. <laughs> so he called me, and uh, I laughed my head off. Uh, so certainly, I would be expecting too much if I don't expect people are wishing me dead. <laughs> so, but um, I, I'm very pleased I'm fit and my doctors have declared me fit, and I'm going back for the final onslaught on TVP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah. What, did you have a view on Sharia law? Oh, Sharia. You see, um, I don't like so much of Sharia, that's why I omitted it. Um, <laughs> I, I had to ask us, us to answer so many questions about Sharia. When I have closed the meeting with, um, especially with the Christian community, the problem is the Nigerian constitution is superior. Um, Sharia is put on the same level with customary laws. Uh, its relevance is limited to inheritance, marriage, you know, and so on. So people that uh, cultures and communities accept. So Sharia is limited to that by our constitution. So anybody who wants to change Sharia will have to go and change the constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. General, thank you very much indeed for a, a, a fascinating, what I found a fascinating address and some very straightforward um, answers to a wide range of questions. Everyone will take their own impressions of today. I suppose most in my mind will be three things that have stuck, struck out. Other people will have other groups. But the three things that I will take away from here was your firm statement about the importance of the electoral timetable now, as amended, um, but that elections alone do not democracy make. Uh, secondly, you're uh, highlighting security and the importance of the welfare and morale of the so Nigerian soldiers who are up there trying to deal with Boko Haram. And thirdly, something which I'm sure will be quoted back to you, probably is already, that corruptors will not be appointed. Uh, the, I'm going to ask you in a moment, uh, audience, to show your appreciation again to General Buhari. Uh, after that, will you please stay in your places because the General has a number of press interviews he's going to give and if everybody comes up and talks to him, we, he'll never get to them. So, uh, I know it's not uh, Nigerian custom, but we're in London. So, <laughs> <laughs> Inste instead of flooding to the front, could you stay put? until General Buhari has left the room. Thank you very much indeed for an inspiring talk. Thank you, Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much indeed.